So good day, dear doctors, and welcome to this mini masterclass in preventive and community medicine. We will take up the must-know concepts you have to bring with you to the board exam regarding epidemiology. So this is Dr. Toom. So question, what do we call the study of the distribution of the determinants of health conditions and events among populations and the application of that study to control health problems. So distribution and determinants of health conditions and events among populations. So this is what we call epidemiology. Okay, the study of the distribution and the determinants of health conditions or diseases amongst populations and the application of that study to control health problems. Now, always remember in epidemiology, uh, our goal is number one, to ask ourselves the following questions. Who is getting sick? What is making them sick? And how can we prevent others from getting sick? Who is getting sick? What is making them sick? And how can we prevent others from getting sick? Now, next, what do we call this concept in epidemiology where there's an external agent, a susceptible host, and an environment? So, Takloyan, there's three agent, host, and an environment. This is what we call the epidemiologic triad. Okay, again, this is what we call the epidemiologic triad. So there's the agent, the host, and the environment. Now, based on the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, this is the epidemiologic triad. You have the agent, the host, and the environment. All three components should be at equilibrium. Any imbalance with one of these three, whether the agent, the host, the environment, or a combination, that would result to disease. Now, what do we call the histogram that displays the course of an outbreak or an epidemic by plotting the number of cases according to the time of onset? a histogram that displays the course of an outbreak or an epidemic by plotting the number of cases according to the time of onset. Okay, This is what we call the epidemic curve. Now, here is a photo of how the epidemic curve looks like. So as you can see, when we say an epidemic, you have a number of clinically confirmed cases which exceeds the normal expected number. So as you can see, shaded in red and in blue, we have there the dotted line, which is the healthcare system capacity. With protective measures, so from the time since the first case is reported, you can see that with protective measures, the healthcare system capacity is manageable and it does not collapse. Without protective measures, look at what happens from the time since a first case is reported. And you can see this as we experience the COVID-19 pandemic in our own country, okay? So this was a classic example of where this uh, figure would be applicable. Now, according to McDonald, these are the basic components of an outbreak investigation. 
So from one to eight, what you have to remember for the exam is number one. And that is before you investigate an outbreak, you must verify the diagnosis and confirm the outbreak. So is this really an outbreak or not? So verify the diagnosis and confirm the outbreak. So after step number one is done, you now have to define a case and you now have to do conduct case finding. You now tabulate whatever data you gather as to time, place, and person. Then you take immediate control measures. Do you isolate? Do you quarantine? You now formulate a test hypothesis. You plan and execute additional studies. You now go to control measures by implementing them, and you have to evaluate these control measures. Then you have to communicate the findings with your local health ministry, with government officials. Politics comes in because you have to communicate with either the barangay captain, the municipal or the city mayor, the governor, and eventually the president. So again, my tip here is no step number one. Verify the diagnosis and confirm the outbreak. So please take note of this. So it's just some terminologies you have to know. Index case, primary case, secondary case. Okay. So again, index, primary, secondary case index, primary, and a secondary case. So the index case is the first person that comes to the attention of the public health authorities. Okay, That is the first person that comes to the attention. Shayung patient number one. So the primary case is the person who acquired the disease from an exposure to the index case. So please take note of this. The primary case, this is the one where we now compute for the attack rate. The secondary case is the person who acquires the disease. Okay, the person who acquires the disease from an exposure to the primary case. And this is now where we measure the secondary attack rate. Now, this is defined as the detection of the occurrence of health-related events and exposures in a target population. So what is your answer here? This is defined as the detection of the occurrence of health-related events in a target population. Okay, very good. That is surveillance. So this is the surveillance cycle according to the CDC. So please take note that the health department is right there in the middle and the public and healthcare providers. So the public and healthcare providers, this includes the clinicians, the doctors, uh, the public health practitioners, laboratories and hospitals. They report to the health department. The health department gives feedback and this goes back to the public and the healthcare providers. So there needs to be an open communication between these two very important stakeholders, and that is the health department and the public and healthcare providers. So this is the surveillance cycle. So what is the use of this public health surveillance data? What is the importance? So public health surveillance data allows us to establish the baseline of a health condition. It helps us understand trends 
as well as patterns of the disease. It can also help us detect outbreaks, as well as emergence of new diseases. And it can also give us the capability of estimating the magnitude of a health problem. So just how severe, serious is a certain health problem. It also helps us identify the different resources which we require or we need during and after public health emergencies. It also allows us to evaluate our existing control measures and our existing public health programs. It also helps us determine the natural history of a disease, monitor changes in infectious agents, set research priorities because from public health surveillance data is a rich source of information which can be used as a stepladder for research. Once there's research in place, we now test the hypothesis. We now carry out research plans, implement, and we now support public health programming. And lastly, monitor changes in health practices. So as you can see, public health surveillance data is very crucial. Okay, so what do we call the resistance to an infectious agent of an entire group or a community as a result of a substantial proportion of the population being immune to the agent? So this is what we call herd immunity. Now, what do we call the time interval from the exposure to an infectious agent to the onset of symptoms of an infectious disease. What do we call the time interval from the exposure to an infectious agent to the onset of symptoms of an infectious disease? So everything begins with exposure. Then the onset of signs and symptoms or the patient becomes symptomatic. So this is called the incubation period. The incubation period is very important for disease surveillance. It's also very important for us to make decisions as to isolation and quarantining of individuals. Now, what do we call the separation of infected persons to prevent the transmission to susceptible individuals? The separation of infected persons to prevent transmission to susceptible ones. So take note, the key word here is letter I, it is infected persons, the people who are confirmed sick. This is isolation. It is very common to interchange the terms isolation and quarantine. So letter I is for infected persons. You are separating the sick from those who are susceptible. Then we have the separation of potentially exposed, but well persons. This is now quarantine. Okay, quarantine refers to the separation of potentially exposed, but well persons. Okay, it refers to the separation of potentially exposed, but well persons. So here, this is in relation to the concept we mentioned earlier. The first case or instance of a patient coming to the attention of the health authorities. The first case or the instance of a patient coming to the attention of health authorities. So this is the index case. Again, this is the index case. Next is the ability of an infectious agent to cause infection. And this is measured as the proportion of persons exposed to an infectious agent who become infected. This is known as the concept of infectivity. 
So you will notice that there are several variants of the COVID-19 virus, different behaviors, which of the variants had the highest mortality? It was the Delta. Okay, the Delta was the one with the highest morbidity and mortality. So I remember Delta as D for death, which had the highest infectivity. Which of the variants had the highest infectivity? Counting exposure, multiple people getting sick from a single exposure. This is the infamous Omicron, okay, the Omicron variant. Now, the ability of an agent to cause disease after infection, and this is measured as the proportion of persons infected by an agent who then experience clinical disease. This is pathogenicity. This is the ability of the agent to cause disease after infection. Now, other examples of diseases which have a high infectivity are measles, chickenpox, high infectivity. Now, what about pulmonary tuberculosis? What is the infectivity nature of pulmonary tuberculosis? Is it high or is it low? Now, tuberculosis is infective, but it is not as infective as the conditions I mentioned, such as measles and chickenpox. Mycobacterium leprae has a very low infectivity. Okay, Mycobacterium leprae has a very low infectivity. Now, what about rabies? Rabies carries a very high case fatality rate. Very high case fatality rate. 